and we are to exude that and practice that and show that to other people. And when we do that, amen, people have a tendency of, of seeing that what you have is genuine and what you have is real. And although people may not agree with everything you say, they have to respect you because they know what you stand for. Amen? People often say if you, if you don't stand for anything, you'll fall for anything. Amen? Amen. So you have to know what you're standing on. And the most important thing we can do as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, is we have to operate in the spirit of integrity. Amen? So let's get Isaiah 55 and 8. Isaiah 55 and 8. That's our text for tonight. Amen. That's our first text for tonight, I should say. Amen. So let's go ahead and get that. Amen. We're going to be on our way. Do you see that one, Deep? Isaiah 55 and 8. So let's, Mother Harris, if you would read that for me, please. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my way, says the Lord. Amen. Let's get 1 John 5 and 2. Should be the next verse deep. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So this we're going to talk about situational ethics. We've been talking about ethics. Last week we talked about cultural ethics, people that believe that whatever the majority is doing, whatever the whatever amendment is passed or what law is passed that is contrary to the word of God, they line up with it and go with the crowd. Amen. We have to be willing to go against the grain as Christians because Amen. God has called us to be a light and if we can't let our light shine if we are in alignment with darkness. Amen. Amen. So we're going to talk about situational ethics, the highest value of this thought pattern or this philosophy is the love principle. What determines right or wrong? Moral standards are determined by what is considered the greatest good or most loving in a given situation. Now, the basis of belief, belief in the importance of freedom for individual choices for making moral decisions and moral accountability. People are self-governing and morally independent. We have to understand that we are not self-governing. We have to know that we have to be governed by who? God. And God governs us through us being led by the Spirit. And we have, when we spend time with God, we learn things of Him. We learn biblical principles and we find application. The things that we can apply to our lives and walk in those things and then he will convict us. He will correct us. He'll make sure we get in place, amen, when we get out of place. So we have to submit ourselves to his governance in our, in our lives. We have to be willing to say, Lord, I know I want this, but you want me to do that. So ultimately, I want to get to a place where I submit to you governing me because you are my Lord. That means you are my master. You're the one that tells me what to do, amen. And oftentimes people get to a place where they don't want anyone to tell them what to do. We have to be willing to let God lead us and direct us. And he will tell us, he will give us very clear mandates. He will give us very clear directives. But oftentimes because of our thoughts, because of what we've been exposed to, because of what we, we've seen, amen, we often say, we don't think that that's what we should do. Amen. Then you have people in your corner around you telling you all these negative things. And you better not try this. And you better not try that. When God has very clearly showed you what he wants you to do. So we are to adhere to God. Amen. We are to do what God tells us to do. And the more consistently you do that, the more you will find the fruit. Amen. Of his blessings in your life. How many people want God to bless them? Amen. We all want God's blessings, so we have to do what's necessary to receive God's blessings. People often want to live the way they want to live, and then all of a sudden they want to come to God when everything crashes, amen, when, when their hopes and dreams begin to collapse, and it's obvious that what they wanted is not going to come to fruition, or they may, they may get it for a little while, and all of a sudden because of their bad ethics, 
because of their bad, their lack of integrity and character, the thing they got for a little while, they messed it up. Amen. We have to understand that if we do things the way God wants us to do things, our success will be sustained. Amen. Because even if we don't have the resources, even if we don't have the know-how ourselves, even if we don't have the people around us that can help us, God will supernaturally, that means that man cannot do it. It's not natural. It's supernatural. Amen. God will do things that, that, that people think cannot be done. Amen. But in order to get that type of blessing in your life, you have to be obedient to God. When you begin to be obedient to man, now you're limited by what man can do because you didn't have the courage to step out on faith and trust God so that you can begin to implement God's power in your situation. No, you wanted to limit God by trusting man. Amen. Ultimately, we have to be willing to say, I love you, but I love God more. Amen. You know what? I want to serve God more than I want to serve you. Now, once you get on the same page, because God's going to always keep us on the same page as long as we are led by the Spirit. God is not the author of what? Confusion. Anytime there's confusion, the enemy has got into somebody or someone has allowed their flesh to determine what they do. God does not create that type of confusion within the context and confines of his will when people are trying to do what he has called them to do. Amen? So that's a good way to find out that the enemy has done something, amen, or you have been selfish yourself, or someone else has all kinds of ambition, all kinds of hopes, and they're not happy. Sometimes when people see you happy, they get mad. When people see you succeeding, you're glad they are angry. And you know what? You have to understand that that's just a part of your success. That's a part of your blessings. Some people don't even, they're not even happy when you get healed. Amen? People that you depend upon, that you always call on, sometimes that gives them a rush. You know, she needs me. She needs me. So it, it gives some people a sense of self-worth. But then once God shifts you, he, he heals you. He helps you to get to a place where you can survive yourself with his help. That person will begin to get upset like you. You don't need me all of a sudden. All of a sudden, you don't want to answer my calls. All of a sudden, you don't call me anymore. You don't need me anymore. Amen. Amen. Instead of understanding that God used them for a season, God used them for a moment to help you. It's just like a crutch. You only need a crutch for a little while until you can walk on your own again. That's like the crutch getting mad at you because you got healed. All of a sudden, your foot feels better. Amen? And so God will often use people as a crutch to help you to function, amen, when you need help functioning. But then God will allow you to do your thing with his help on your own. And you show your appreciation, amen? But you don't need their validation, amen? You have to understand that because people will make you feel bad for not needing them like you used to need them, amen? They'll throw a guilt trip on you and make you feel as if now you think you are better than me, amen? Instead of saying, I'm so glad that I was there to help her when she was down, I'm so glad that God used me to be a blessing to her. I'm so glad that she is healthy, she's whole, she can function. It's just like training wheels, amen? Amen. You have to use the training wheels until you can keep your own balance and keep riding without falling over. But you should be grateful that God has used you at any time in your life to be a blessing to someone else. You have to wonder if they really wanted you to be healthy. Did they really want you to be healthy when they were trying to help you? It's just like a doctor that keeps finding things wrong with you. And really, there might not be anything wrong with you because they want to keep you coming and they can get that insurance money. Amen? Amen. So you have to make sure that you see God. Amen. And sometimes you know what? You better get a second opinion. 
Sometimes you might have to get a third opinion. Amen? So you have to understand that, that, that oftentimes we, have, we feel like we're self-governing and, and morally independent. But on this side and even on the other side, we are always totally and completely dependent upon God. We can't just do what we want to do. We can't just live the way we want to live. And we certainly can't treat people any way we want to treat them. Now we are to do what God has called us to do. What is the definition of being Christ-like? It means to be like Christ. If Jesus wouldn't do it, you shouldn't do it. If Jesus wouldn't treat them a certain way, you should treat them a certain way. If Jesus wouldn't show them and look down upon them, you shouldn't show them and look down upon them. You have to understand that you are to be shaped in the image of God and be Christ like you are his representative. And what you have to realize is that the only Bible that certain people are reading is you. What scriptures are they seeing in your life, in your conduct, in your walk? What scriptures are they seeing being manifest in your conduct? How you respond to them, how you treat them, how you love them, how you help them. What are people seeing on your job? What are people seeing even if you go play bingo? What are people seeing when you play shuffleboard? What are they seeing? What happens when you mess up and you lose in bingo? Huh? See, I'm trying to reach everybody. Amen. Amen? You have to understand that you have to be governed by God. Amen? Amen? Amen. And so the problem with this premise is there are no moral absolutes. Decisions are made on assumed consequences instead of an, on eternal principles. No criteria exists to define love. And people do so many things in the name of love. Amen? Amen? Amen. And God never told you to do that in the name of love. People do some crazy things and oh, I just love them. I, I just love them. I, I couldn't help myself. Amen? And so you are making yourself look foolish and then even people connected to you are looking foolish because they're trying to support you and help you and you're talking about you just love. But God is trying to get your attention. That ain't the kind of love I'm talking about. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, sister girl, that ain't love. Amen? Some people might define that as insanity. But you're doing it in the name of L-O-V-E when it's I-S-A-N-E. Amen? So we have to make sure that our definition of love is gleaned from the Bible. Amen? From the Word of God. From what Jesus did for us. Christ surpassed our faults and supplied our needs. Amen? He loved us in spite of us. Amen? And sometimes, amen, he chastens those that he loves. And that means that that's tough love. Amen? God has to sometimes break you down before he can build you up the right way because you're trying to stand up on a structure, amen, a foundation that's antiquated, that cannot sustain your success that God has placed on your heart. The system that you are adhering to will only sustain you temporarily. But God is trying to change your foundation. He's trying to build you up again after breaking you down. Now what you're standing on is his word. And when you stand up on his word, his word will never fail. The foundation will never crack. A sinkhole will not take it down. The word of God will always stand. Everything can go down, but the word of God is never going down. The grass withered, the flower faded, but the word of God shall stand forever. It's been stress tests. It's going through tsunamis. It's going through hurricanes. It's going through all kinds of problems, issues, cares, and concerns. I don't care if a lion comes. I don't care if a bear comes. I don't care what happens. It may be a giant that's nine feet tall. It can be cancer. It can be diabetes, hypertension. It can be all kinds of problems. But if you stand up on the word of God, you got to understand it's been tested and tried and it's still there. You got to stand up on his word. 
That's the only way we can make it through the vicissitudes of life, the changes of life, the things that are introduced in our lives that we don't expect to happen in our lives. We have to understand that we have to stand up on God's word. If you don't know what to do, you better find the scripture that you can apply to your situation. Don't call sister girl. Don't go to try to find someone that's a psychic. You better go to the word of God. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He knows better than we know. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what's around the corner. He knows how he's going to bring you out. He's already put it in place for you. The ram is already in the bush, but you can't see it because you keep going through the psychic that keeps taking all your money. The root book that has no power over God. You better to stop taking your money to the devil worshiper and take your time, your talent, and your treasure to the one that can change your situation. God is able, amen? How many people can agree that God is able? He's able. He's able. Yes. The conclusion is God's ways are not our ways. We show love best by following God's way. Amen? Sometimes you have to cut bait. You've been fishing in a certain place for too long. Peter said, Lord, we've been fishing. We fished all night long. The Lord told them to throw down the nets one more time. And they threw down the nets, and they were professional fishermen. Peter knew that it was over. But let me tell you this. God supernaturally led the fish to swim around the net, gave the fish a mechanism in their mind to avoid the net that they could not see. Because normally if you put down a net, you can't see a net in the water, and the fish who are swimming by, unaware of the net, will just get caught up in the net. But in that moment, at that night, the one that created the fish told the fish to go a different direction. Until Peter decided to obey him in spite of what things look like, Jesus told him to put down the net again. And then all of a sudden, all the fish that he sent in a different direction, he sent them in the right direction. And there were so many fish that the fish almost took the boat down. That's what you have to understand, is that God will dry some things up in your life sometimes. Yes, he will purposely dry up the things that you have leaned upon, depended upon, that you put your trust in, the people who are your confidants and your constituents, the people that you can always call on in your difficult time. And all of a sudden, God will begin to dry up the brook. He'll begin to seize the source. He'll begin to sift out the things that you, you depend upon so that now you have to understand. Peter knew without a doubt that Jesus, at that, even before that moment, Jesus was the one that blessed him to be able to have a fishing enterprise. Peter had multiple fishing boats. Amen? And so now, at that very moment, he realized that the power of God was the source that blessed him. See, what you have to understand is that Peter had to be a successful fisherman first. Before Jesus could say, now I'm going to make you official men. See, Peter had to understand that, yes, there is a method to the madness. I can't just go out there and get a, a brim like I get a bass. I can't just go out there and get a bluegill, amen, like I get a salmon. There is a specific way. First off, you got to go into salt water to get certain type of fish, and then fresh water to get other types of fish. You can't expect to catch, amen, a salt water fish in a, in a lake. Amen? And then you get mad because you didn't catch a salt water fish when you're in the wrong type of water. So Peter had to become proficient. He had to get to a place where he understood the crap of fishing. He understood that it took some technique. You can't just get on the water and all of a sudden expect to be successful enough to have a business and feed your family and also sell fish to the community. No, you had to learn how to be a fisher, a true professional fisherman. Amen? And so Jesus had to give him that type of success and knowledge so he could translate that type of knowledge into being a fisher of what? Men. 
So now you got to be just as creative. Paul said, for all men, I become all things. Amen. As a Gentile, I'll become a Gentile. For a Jew, I'll become a Jew. Whatever I need to be to reach you, I'm willing to be like a chameleon, not compromising. But I'm willing to meet you where you are so that I can be crafty and creative. So I can make the gospel plain to you so the Lord can draw you in as I lift him up. That's what we have to understand. The success that God has given us in our past was not by chance. Even when we did not know him and then have a relationship with him. He allowed us to be exposed to certain knowledge, certain information, and certain people. So that now when he shifts our lives, he changes our hearts. Now we can say, just like you use that knowledge that you gleaned in the world, I want you to now use it for my kingdom. But oftentimes, we forget about the, the knowledge that we gained in the world. And we sit down on it and not use it in God's kingdom. Look at what Paul did. Put just as much effort into advancing God's kingdom as he did in tearing it down. But once we get saved, all the times we feel like we've arrived. I'm good now. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Once saved, always saved. So now, I only have to do so much because then the pastor say it's not about my works. Amen? But the pastor also said that it's not by works, but if you are saving, you ought to be working. That's the fruit of your salvation. That's the outward, that's an outward sign of an inward spiritual grace. So you should exert and exhaust just as much effort in the context and the confines of the church as you exhausted out there in the world trying to get your party on, trying to get your tip on, trying to get your drink on, trying to get your club on. You exhausted so much effort, spent so much time, so much money trying to be cool, trying to be like everybody else, then all of a sudden God grabs a hold of your life and you want to sit down, be quiet, and do nothing for him. The devil is a liar. If God wanted that type of response to him saving you, he could have left you out there. He didn't just save you because you cute. He didn't save you because he, he knows you're going to bring your tithe to the church. He saved you because he wanted to use you. All the talent he gave you in your mother's womb, all your propensities, all your gifts, even your stature, your voice pattern, your hands, your feet, all that stuff was passed on from the DNA of your parents because God saw past where they were at that moment. He saw you coming and he already put a place and position for you to work within the confines of it. You have to understand that our lives are a tale that's already told. And that's why we have to have the desire to seek God, to love the way he wants us to love, to conduct ourselves the way he wants us to conduct ourselves. Because the only way we're going to fulfill the potential that God gave us before the foundation of the world is that we have to be willing to be governed by him, led by him, corrected by him, chastened by him. You have to understand that just because God chastens you, amen? A lot of people get mad at God. You know you need some discipline in your life. Sometimes God has to spank you. What if you never got spanked when you were a child? What if your mama just let you act as you, how you wanted to act? What if your mama didn't love you enough to get you ready to go to school? Didn't put any discipline on you. Didn't put any parameters in your life. Didn't say you should do this, but you should do that. You should say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. What if she didn't love you enough to train you? Amen. When you went to the school, they would say, this child is... Huh? But who is that a reflection on? It's on the parents. So that's the same thing that people think when you call yourself a Christian and you act like a devil, there's no fruit in your life. You're just as hateful as a burnt cat. You just mistreat people all the time and it's not a reflection on you, it's a reflection on your maker. Okay. If God can't change her, why would I submit myself to him? But they don't realize it's not because of God, it's because of you. 
And so we have to be willing to submit ourselves to, to his correction. The Bible says, spare the rod and spoil the child. And God spared the rod in your life. He will spoil you. God loves you too much to spoil you. Amen? Amen. He wants to produce the optimal level of fruit in your life. And the only way he can do that is he has to prune you. He has to cut some things back in your life. He has to literally do surgery on you. He has to love you to take the time to do surgery on you. Amen. Amen. Isn't that love? Yes. Somebody say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We often say, create in me a clean heart oh, yes. and renew in me a right spirit. Yes. How does God do that? Thank you, Lord. He can't take the good stuff out. He has to go in there and take the bad stuff out. In order for him to take the bad stuff out, he has to be very meticulous, very careful. Amen? Just like someone that if they don't put a mark on your hand, they, they're supposed to be cutting off something and they don't put a mark and they mess around and cut off the wrong thing. You cut off my good toe. What that wrong with that toe? Now I gotta lose another toe because now you still gotta get the bad toe. So God has to make sure that he severs the bad things out of your life and leave the good things. Amen? Amen. 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 So we have to submit to God. What if you were in surgery? All of a sudden, you, the anesthesia roll just wore off in the middle of the surgery. Six hours surgery, in the middle of that three hours, you just all of a sudden wake up. And you jump off the table. <laughs> bleeding and stuff connected to you and they think you were crazy. And then they didn't even get to a place where they could put you back together. They didn't even get a chance to put the thing on the inside of you that was supposed to or corrected. And you just jumped off. And then all of a sudden you say, okay, I won't do it again, doctor. Give me another appointment to have this surgery. And then you come back. And the doctor is gracious enough to give you another chance. Okay, I'll give you another chance. This time they got another anesthesiologist. Because the anesthesiologist before, he didn't give you enough anesthesia. And then all of a sudden, you got past the halfway point, you got to the three-quarter point. And you woke up, oh, there she go again. And you got up on the table again, still got the problems, nothing got fixed, but you keep getting up off the table. Oh, it's funny, but that's the same thing we do to God. God is trying to keep us in place on the potter's wheel. So he can shape us and mold us, chasten us, take the, ne the, thing, the negative things out of us, the corrupt things out of us, the fouls that keep pulling us back into our old life, the things he wants to change us, but we keep getting up and walking away. We keep getting angry. We keep getting frustrated. We don't want to submit to his skillful hand as the great physician. We don't want to take correction. We want to keep doing things the way we used to do things. We want to keep acting the way we used to act. We don't want to challenge ourselves to change and finally line up with God. Finally give Him our whole hearts. That's just like the person that keeps getting up off of the operating table and walking out with blood coming out and all kinds of problems and all the things you need. You left those things behind and now you say, I'll be all right. No, you won't be all right. You have to stay in place so that God can do the work on you that he has to do. This work is required because we must understand that we are all sick and in need of intensive care. It's like a triage unit. Some people are further along. Good job, take it down there. Some people are further along. Amen. Some people may have a finger problem and the doctor will let you sit into the operating room for a little while longer because you got somebody over there, amen, that, that, that's, that can't breathe, so they need to triage and get that person back there quick, amen? But at the same time, we all are in the, the waiting room. You never know when your number's going to be called to get that change. Worst thing you can do is walk out the waiting room. Amen. The Bible says, wait, I say, on the Lord. 
And you have to be still. Now, I didn't know he was going to do it eventually. And I didn't know he was going to change me eventually. If I didn't know he was going to restore what I lost eventually and eventually give me double for my trouble. If I didn't have a spirit of expectation. If you didn't know that eventually you're going to get the care you needed, you wouldn't be sitting in the waiting room at the hospital. But you stay there because you know eventually they're going to call your name. And the pain you've been dealing with that compelled you to go won't subside because the doctor's going to give you what you need. Oftentimes because we don't know, we go. That's why you have to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind has to be transformed before God will, will work through your change mentality and change your heart. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Have you ever thought one thought with your heart? No, it's talking about your emotional state. It's talking about the fact that within your heart, God has shaped your heart, changed your heart. He's taking a stony heart out of your flesh and giving you a heart of flesh. Now you can be still, and even when your emotions go crazy, you can still stay there and wait for God to perfect those things that concern you. He does not come when you want him to come, but you have to know cognitively he'll be right on time. It's not about what I want, when I want, how I want it. It's about what God has ordained in my life, and what is for me will eventually come to me, but I need to stay where I'm supposed to stay to get what God has ordained for me. I want everything God has for me. I don't want chores, I don't want chores, and I don't want chores. Because if I want chores, I want chores, and I want chores, that would mean I'm coveting. And I'm not coveting anything when I want everything God has for me. It's not for you, it's for me. So in order for me to get everything God has for me, I need to adhere to what God tells me, and then God will bless me. You ought to say, Lord, thank you for what you keep teaching me in my life. Amen. That's why you are not getting mad at people when they get blessed. Amen. They're just getting what God has for them. That's right. That's right. That's right. Especially if they have done things the way they're supposed to do things. And all of a sudden God is blessing them, promoting them, and producing what he promised them. They've been declaring and decreeing, sowing their time, and they say it with their whole heart. And all of a sudden what they said, don't you know that God will do exactly what he said he will do? And then all of a sudden what God promised them is coming to fruition. And you got the audacity to get mad because God is blessing them. Like they say, ain't nobody mad but the devil. And those people who allow them, to allow the devil to get in them, they get mad too. So when we say ain't nobody mad but the devil, you mad too because the devil is leading you instead of the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's not right. That's not right. Oh, we love to say ain't nobody mad but the devil. And you mad too. So what does, what does that make you? Huh? Oh, ain't nobody mad but the devil. We just said, don't even think about it. We just said. And then you sitting there trying to contain yourself, trying to look new. You mad. You stuck in your toe. <laughs> if you were Caucasian, you'd be turning white. I'm turning red. But we don't turn red. Okay. Amen. <laughs> it will be obvious. But you trying to hold it in. But you mad. So you got to understand that when you get mad when someone else gets blessed, that's not of God. Amen. 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 And you may be living in your own blessing. Amen. Amen. Because God loves the people that you hate. Amen. Oh my goodness. Write that down. That's profound. That's from God. Amen. The people you hate, yes. God loves them. Why else would he say, love your enemies? Because he loves your enemies. And who does he want us to be like? Him. Yes, Lord. Hmm? So we have to understand the, the bar is high. Yes. So Christians are called to exhibit the love of God through personal sacrifices. You know what? I may not be happy naturally when you get your blessing, but I'm going to make myself be happy. 
I'm going to make myself congratulate you. I'm going to pull this old filthy, dirty flesh and I'm going to shake your hand and say congratulations. I don't care what my emotions dictate. I don't care how I feel about it. God told me to do it, so I'm going to do it. The problem is, is that we allow our flesh to govern us. The problem is, we allow our feelings to govern us. The problem is, we allow our emotions, which are here today and there today, all over the place like a roller coaster. That's why your life is like a roller coaster, because you allow your your emotions and your feelings dictate your reaction and your responses. You got to understand you'll never find stability. You'll never find a place where God can help you to find your equilibrium and also find your balance if you're always tapping into your emotions and in your feelings. Because there is no good thing in your flesh, and your flesh is directly connected to your emotion. Sometimes you don't feel like doing the things of God. If you want to be honest, sometimes you don't feel like praying. Sometimes you don't feel like laying aside, putting down the plate, because you're hungry. I know Jesus had to be hungry. He had fasted for 40 days. After he was baptized, the first thing the Spirit sent him to do is to go into the wilderness for 40 days and to fast. And at the end of the day, come on, Satan, talk about chunk this rock, this stone into bread. He was hungry. Right. Jesus got hungry just like we get hungry. What did he say on the cross? I thirst. What did he do when he showed up after the resurrection and walked through the door and the door wasn't open? What did they do? They ate fish. So we had to be hungry. What is that lesson for you and for me? Just because the flesh wants it, don't mean you give it to it. You have to learn to put your flesh into subjection. And sometimes you got to talk to your flesh. I don't care how you feel. I don't care what kind of emotions or what kind of burdens come up in me. You can't have it because God said you can't have it. And I'm going to be led by the Spirit and not by you because there is no good thing in this. Touch yourself. But you have to learn that so you can know that and be governed by that. You can't just do what you feel like doing. But we want all of God's blessings. But I'm concerned that over the last 20, 30, 40 years in the church holistically, not just in, but just nationally and, and across the world, we fell in love with the blessings of God, but not the blesser. Amen. The blessings can change, the blessings can come, and the blessings can go. But if we lose anything that God blessed us with, the blesser, if he did it before, he can do it again. So people can come, people can go. Things can come and things can go. Money can take wings and soar away and you can lose everything, but God can give you double for your trouble. That's why you better not fall in love with things. You better fall in love with the one that provided the things. All right, all right. That's good, that's good. That's what God is calling us to do. We need to fall back in love with our first love. No one should have to force you to pray. Bible study in church is a wonderful thing. But we should, if we understood the importance of prayer, the Bible says pray without ceasing. You have not because you ask not. If people understood the significance and importance and the value in prayer, we would have just as many people here for prayer. As we do. And I know some people get off from work, man, you can't get, but if you are available, you should be trying to make it to prayer me. Because that's how you have access to God. That's how you tap into God. That's how you make your request known unto God. 
We just haphazardly pray. When's the last time you tarried at the altar? When's the last time you stayed up all night long? When's the last time you said, I can't go to sleep. I need God to do something for me. I need God to do something for my children. I'm not going to stop praying until you do it, God. I'm going to do whatever I can do personally and individually to intercede on the behalf of this situation. I want to tarry, tarry, tarry. I'm going to knock until the door shall be open unto me. I'm going to seek you until I find what you have for me. I need you like I've never needed you before, but oftentimes we do haphazard prayers. We do five minute prayers, minute rice prayers. We do prayers, amen, and we feel like we've done enough. What well, God did way more than that for us, and we need to be willing to turn off the television, put down Facebook, and get away from people sometimes, and go into your prayer closet and tear before God for some hours. You got a DVR, you ought to record the show, you can watch it later. But there's something pressing in your life. You need to get before God's face and you need to let your heart be made bare before God and say, Lord, I need you to do something that no one else can do. I'm not going to stop until you do it. But this society has limited our ability to concentrate and to wait. Everything is so instant. Everything is so immediate. That's why the young generation struggles because they did not experience the time when you had to wait. They didn't experience the time when you had to stop at a payphone. They didn't experience the time when you had to go to the bus stop. They didn't experience the time when you had to walk to church. They didn't experience any of that stuff. The only thing they got is instant and immediate. And now when it's time for God to, to delay something, they get restless. They want to try something else. You have to understand God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not changing because technology advances. He's God. Amen. And so we have to be willing to wait, I say, on the Lord. And God has given you conviction. If he's given you a burden, if he's promised you something, someone say, all I need is one promise. Once God has promised you something, you have to be intentional in seeking that thing from God. Come hell, come high water, whatever comes against you, because opposition is always going to come when God has led you to do something. The devil's not going to just sit back and let you get it. He's going to do everything he can to stop you. And the greater the opposition, the greater the blessing on the other side. You have to understand that's an indication and an indicator. The more the devil tries to turn up the heat in your life, the more he's trying to block you from something supernatural that's going to change your life, shift it and turn it upside down and bless you more than you ever thought you could be blessed. You have to understand that when the devil, if the devil would be fighting you like that, right. if he wasn't right. afraid of what God was getting ready to do in your life. You, so you have to understand what some people go through it. I know we are the lesson not being led by the Spirit. Amen. Some people go through it and they get frustrated. We all get frustrated for a little while, but you have to snap back, snap out of it, and understand that God has a purpose for everything I go through. God has a plan. God is trying to do something. God is trying to produce something, and the only way a baby can be born if the mama has to go through pain. What you have to understand is that the first trimester, the second trimester, the baby gets progressively larger. Then at the end of that third trimester, the baby's uncomfortable and the mama's uncomfortable. Your feet are swollen, you wobble around, and you're ready. This day can't come soon enough. And the same thing applies. And if you don't have a C-section, amen, you have a natural birth, you got to push, you got to push, you're going to feel some pain, you're going to feel some suffering, but at the end of that season, when you go through all that pain, when you see that little baby, that little bundle of joy, you forget about all that. Think about the things you've gone through in your life that it felt so terrible, and us men, we can't relate to that. Amen? But we feel your pain. But think about the things that we've gone through in our lives. Amen. The sickness that we've had to deal with. 
the sickness that we've had to deal with, Sister Goodson. It was a long time you had to go through it. But then when she got the call and said the kidney was ready. Huh? That's right. And so it was a long time. And now that you look back, you say, Lord, I thank you for getting me through it. And it wasn't as bad as it appeared to be because it was a part of my plan, my purpose. Amen? And so that's what you have to understand. You can't get up off the table. You can't give up in the middle of the birthing process. God is trying to birth something in your life. You have to go through the pain to produce the promise. It's a process that cannot be circumnavigated and cannot be going around. Stop running around talking about your time. I made up my mind I'm not going to say it anymore. Because anyone that's trying to do something productive in this life, anyone that's trying to make a difference in this world, you're going to be tired. You can rest when you die. See, I understand you. I need to get about six, five, but, but I'm not going to get always get eight hours of sleep. I understand that. And I embrace that. Because if I wanted to be lazy, I wouldn't be able to be productive. Laziness and production is like oil and water. They don't mix. I really believe that the more you say you're tired, the more tired you become. You speak, oh, I'm so tired. I don't feel good. I tell people all the time, you better add on the end of that, I don't feel good right now. Because the more you perpetually speak over your life, you don't feel good. You ain't gonna never feel good. God had a plan to make you feel better tomorrow. But because you put your words in his way, that tiredness and sickness is going to stay where it's at. The power of life and death is right here in your tongue. And so you have to be willing to do no way. And that's what faith is all about. No matter how tired you are, no matter how bad you feel, through your transformed mind, through your clean heart, you should be willing to put forth the effort because I promise you that you may feel tired, but God will always give you the energy you need to do what he's called you to do. Amen? How many people can testify that God told you to do something, you felt tired, you felt bad, and all of a sudden you get you did it, and you received a rush of energy, and all of a sudden you started feeling better, you started to wake up and to lighten up, and you started to just say, Lord, I'm grateful that I was willing to step up, because I feel so much better. And then you look back and say, Lord, I'm so glad you used me to be a blessing. It's better to give than to receive. God will bless you to be a blessing to others, and you're willing to stop making excuses and just just do what God told you to do. Tell you people, stop making excuses. Stop. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. Stop it. They're just getting in your way. Amen. Stop making excuses. Amen. Somebody say stop it. Let's get Jeremiah 17 and 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperate, wicked. Who can know it? Let's get Colossians 3 8 through 10. But your heart just set on something, huh? Heart is deceitful, wicked. Oh, just because you want it, don't mean you need it. Amen. But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man who is renewed and knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Amen. Thank you. So the next, the next point is e emotive ethics. The highest value is to focus on feelings. How you feel about it. Well, this is how I feel about it. But never found out what God's desire was concerning it. 
what God's will is concerning you. This is how I feel about it. And write this down. The enemy has deceived more people through their feelings. He's deceived more people through their emotions. You have to understand that that's his workshop. He works through your feelings. He works through your emotions. Amen? You have to understand that. Amen? And now you have to know that just because I feel this way doesn't mean it's the right way. I still have to seek God so he can confirm and validate my feelings. And sometimes he has to check you, amen? Sometimes he has to convict you and say, you were wrong for feeling that way about her. You were wrong for feeling that way about him. You were wrong for treating this person that way. You were wrong. And I want you to go and swallow your pride and apologize because you were dead wrong. That's a hard thing to do, to admit that you're wrong. When you felt strongly about it, the Apostle Paul felt strongly about persecuting the way. Jesus showed up and said, it is me who thou art persecuting. It's hard for thee to kick against the bricks. It took Jesus himself in his resurrected, resurrected state to get Paul's attention. He was so focused on destroying the way Christianity that Jesus himself, and that was not just, just something that Jesus did. Jesus also had to appear to him in his resurrected state so that he could be validated and confirmed as an apostle. That's one of the criteria of the apostles. They had to see Jesus in his resurrected state. So God knows what he's doing. I'm telling you that he knows what he's doing. Yes, yes. One determines right or wrong. Actions are determined by personal preference. Whatever feels good is acceptable. But if that was true, I just feel like slapping a taste out your mouth. Oh, I feel it all slap. Ooh. Does that make it right? Oh, and what I love is say, I'm going to give her a piece of my mouth. You wait till I see her. I don't care if I see her in Publix or Walmart or at the church. I'm going to give her a piece of my mind. I feel like going off on her. I'm going to tear her up and down to the floor. I'm going to let her know how I feel. But the Lord is telling you to pride your tongue. The battle is mine. I will repay. I don't want you to act like a fool. I want you to act like you know me. Watch this, the basis of belief. Belief that moral decisions are simply an expression of personal feelings which are neither good nor bad. So what I feel determines right or wrong. That's my, that's my compass. That's my moral compass, amen? So you know what? It, it, it's neither good nor bad. It's okay because that's what I feel. If I feel it, I'm going to do it. Amen? Think about how many marriages have been destroyed because I, I feel it, I'm going to do it. Think about how many children have been messed up because I feel it, I'm going to do it. Think about how many dreams, hopes, and aspirations have been crushed and, and damaged because I feel it, I'm going to do it. I don't feel like reading today. I don't feel like doing my resume. I don't feel like going to interview, but I want a job. I need some benefits. I need some health insurance, but I don't want to read. I don't want to do the interview, and I don't want to get my resume. I just want to poof, all of a sudden get a job. The devil is a liar. You have to check your feelings. Put your feelings in place and check them and move them out the way. Some of, some of us need to run around and, and gather our feelings, pick them up, put them in a box, and put them, y'all know how they put the Bible in the back window? They still doing that? Yeah, I saw one the other day. Riding on the road, the Bible had a suntan. I want to say, do you really just pull it out on Sunday? Because if you read it during the week, it ain't going to be. Huh? The Bible had a suntan. At least you ought to put some suntan lotion on it. Didn't have any tan or anything. Just sitting right there, sun all beaming on it. We have to understand that we have to value it and let God lead us and guide us. And guess what? 
God will always let you know when you're wrong. The Holy Spirit, he will always do his job. And conviction always leads to correction if you allow it to. He will convict you if you keep overriding, overriding, ignoring, walking away from, and not adhering to. He's going to give you over to a rubber big line and say, I'm going to just give her to her desires. I'm going to let her have what she wants, and that's a problem. If you don't feel conviction, you better go back to the altar and say, Lord, take not my Holy Spirit away from me. Let me receive the, receive the joy of my salvation. I want to feel what I felt before. Amen. I can't afford to walk away from conviction because conviction keeps me calibrated. Conviction keeps me on a straight and narrow. Conviction keeps me loving and acting the way I'm supposed to love and act. Conviction keeps me being an ambassador of Christ and not a fool. I want to be like Christ. And if you don't convict me, lead me and correct me, and you don't chase me, I'm in trouble because there's something on the inside of me that's corrupt, that's messed up. I need to make sure I have a promise in me that will make sure I stay in the place God told me to stay in. God loves you so much that he will correct you. A mama that loves you will always correct you. I don't care how you respond. I don't care how you like it or don't like it. She's going to keep telling you you're wrong. She's going to keep telling you when you're right. I don't care. And back in the day, she will slap you in your mouth. You can't do it today like you used to do it. But back in the day, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you find yourself getting up off the floor so quick. Amen. Amen. Mama just flip. The kids are calling the police. They <laughs> better not do it. And I'm, not, I'm not endorsing that. I'm not condoning it. I'm not saying it's right. You know, I'm, just saying, I'm just talking about how it used to be. Amen. Never know who's watching. Amen. 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 But, but oftentimes the same thing happens. We're almost done. But, but doesn't God sometimes, either he does things in our lives, or he permits things that happen in our lives. And before we know it, we'll find ourselves getting back up. We'll find ourselves on the floor. We'll find ourselves in a place that is so difficult that we can't turn to anyone but God. God will box us in and put us in a situation that we can't use our intellect to figure out the situation. No one has enough resources to finance it because there's some things that money cannot buy. You could be a billionaire, and guess what? Tell your neighbor, billionaires still die. If you could find a way of finance living forever, I promise you there are some billionaires that would never die. Amen. But no matter how much money you have, there are some things that money cannot buy. I don't care how many zeros you have on the check. It can't buy. But God can Provide. But God. Somebody say, won't he do it? Yes, he will. Hasn't he already done it over and over and over again? How many people have a testimony tonight? Amen. 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 So, all right, so moral accountability. People have free choice because there are no standards by which to judge accountability. No standards. Amen. Do whatever you want to do. Amen. Complaint about Christianity. Christians cannot make moral judgments on facts. Because morality is based on individual feelings. Amen? Amen. Amen. We have stand up on the word. That's what boxes us in. That's what helps us to correct ourselves. And God corrects us too. Problem with the promise. Human selfishness is allowed full reign as ethical judgments become immune to reason. Amen? I'm not going to reason because reasoning goes against what I feel. God has worked through my mind to show me what I need to do. But because I feel so good about this, I'm not going to meditate or reason. I'm just going to do it. Reason, reason, reasoning is a mechanism that God has given us, which is a blessing that separates us from the animal kingdom. Amen. A lot of times we act like animals because we won't reason. We won't be proactive. We just are reactive. We have to stop, pause, and utilize the faculties that God has given us. You can't just do anything when you don't know what to do. You have to wait for God to tell you, show you what to do. And sometimes you'll send someone else to convince something he's placed on your heart. But you can't move until God tells you to move. Amen? Amen. Conclusion, emotions are not 
a dependable God for actions. God does set limits on human behavior. Isn't that a blessing? Christian calling. Christians are called to maintain integrity by living according to biblical principles. That's what we are called to do. That's how we please God. By doing what God tells us to do. Doesn't it make you happy when your child does what you tell them to do? When you know it's right? Are we not God's children? And if God is pleased with you, it doesn't matter who's not pleased with you. God can still give you what he promised you. Amen? Amen. So we should be trying to what? Please God. Behind closed doors and out of the public. Wherever we are, our goal and our objective should be to please God. Amen? Amen. If you serve him the right way, obey him the right way, he'll bless you the right way. God bless you. I'd like to personally thank you for tuning in to our online broadcast on our online campus today. May God continue to bless you, keep you, and exalt you in due time. I believe that God has something great in store for you this upcoming week. You have to believe it by faith. You'll be able to walk into it. And continue to join us on this platform, uh, whether it's through Facebook or YouTube or on our website, however you're tuning in and connecting with us. We certainly appreciate it. We ask you to join us again on next Wednesday, this upcoming Wednesday, at 6.30 for the Empowered Hour. Also on next Sunday, we ask you to join us again for both the 8 o'clock and also the 11 o'clock worship services. God has something in store for you. I'll pray for you and you pray for us, and God will bless us all in our endeavors according to his will. Thank you once again, and may God continue to bless you where you are.